Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to Good Orderly Direction, Practical Tools of the Bible. I'm your host, Dr. Donnelly Snipes. Today we're discussing Exodus 23, even more laws and a plan. Before we get started, please remember to like, subscribe, and share. That really helps us reach more people and grow the channel. We've already gone through the Ten Commandments, and in chapters 21 and 22, we went through a lot of other laws, but there's still a few more. Do not lie. Okay, that's pretty self-explanatory, and you can see why it would be important in a interdependent community in, and in an interdependent, somewhat isolated community. Remember, they're wandering in the wilderness right now. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. I love this one. I mean, God spells it out. Think for yourself. Be prudent. Be respectful of others. If they're going to do it, okay, that's on them. You may try to educate them. Respect their boundaries, though. And do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. If you find someone's property, return it. It's not finders, keepers, losers, weepers. It is, you know, I found something. Let me see if I can find the rightful owner. If you see someone struggling, even someone who hates you, help them. And this is really hard. When someone does not like us, it's intimidating. It's anxiety provoking to go over and try to help them. It, it can feel very threatening, but God says it's the right thing to do. If they're struggling, we need to extend an arm, an olive branch to help them through their troubles. Do not deny justice to the poor. And I would argue this means the poor in spirit or the poor in money. People who are poor in money we need to make sure that they get adequate justice, that they get all that they deserve and that they are treated well, that they're not taken advantage of. If they are accused of something, that they get the same treatment as someone who has a lot of money. In today's society, we don't see that. And it's heartbreaking. We see the people who are poor typically have attorneys, lawyers, who are less um, seasoned, we will say. You know, they're the, the people that are straight out of law school. And some of them may be brilliant, but some of them may not have really gotten their, gotten in their stride yet. And that's very disheartening because it does create disparities between the haves and the have-nots. But I would also argue that this means do not deny justice to the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit are the people who are meek. They're the people who may not speak up. They're the people who may end up being walked over or taken advantage of because they are, um, well, meek. They're, I can't find any other word for it. And we need to make sure that those people also have justice, that they are not taken advantage of just because they don't fight back. Do not accept bribes. <laughs> pretty straightforward. Unfortunately, bribes are pretty common in today's world, especially in, uh, in politics, from what I understand. But don't accept them. It's just not okay. And do not oppress a foreigner. And we talked about that in the last video. We were once foreigners. Whenever you move somewhere, you know, you move from, when we moved from Florida to Tennessee, now we weren't a foreigner in terms of being a, um, not an American, but we were not Tennesseans. We were Floridians. Uh, it's important to not oppress other people because they are not familiar with your ways. They're not familiar with your environment. When we moved here, we had to learn our way around. We had to learn where the stores were. We had to find new doctors. When my uh, daughter's in-laws moved to this country, you know, they had to learn a whole lot about you know, the country. They had to go through the uh, immigration process. They had to learn about um, 
what they needed to do to get a job and everything was different here. And we need to recognize that because our system is pretty convoluted, to be quite frank, uh, foreigners, people who come here legally and really are trying to do the right thing, still may fall between the cracks, still may be oppressed or uh, taken advantage of, not necessarily overtly, not that somebody means to, but they don't even know what resources are out there for them. So it's really important to recognize the needs of people and to help whenever possible if someone is new to your community or new to your country. Let your land rest on the seventh year and allow the poor and the wildlife to get food from it. We talk about in, in gardening, especially organic gardening, we talk a lot about crop rotation because every crop takes different nutrients from the soil. And as you rotate the crops, the they will pr put down certain nutrients and take up certain nutrients. However, periodically, the ground and... Uh, Biblically, the ground just needs to rest every once in a while and rejuvenate itself, rejuvenate its microbiome in the soil. And biblically, you're supposed to do it every seventh year. Now, in communities uh, back then, they would alternate who was letting their land rest. Obviously, all the farmers wouldn't let, let their land rest on the seventh year or nobody would eat. So it's important to communicate these things. But this is a way of keeping the soil healthy, making sure that the food that's grown on the soil is rich with nutrients and that the land, that the ground can actually produce that resting year when the land is not being farmed. Like I said, the microbiome is redeveloping. The animals, the wildlife are going there and they're feeding, but they're also pooping, you know. I know, I said poop, but it's important to recognize that manure is a really good, um, really good fertilizer. It just has to have time to break down in order to be able to be used by the plants. So this was a really good uh, setup, if you will. Similarly, work six days a week and rest on the seventh so that you are refreshed. Now, they didn't say work uh, Monday through Saturday and rest on Sunday necessarily. They say work six days a week and rest on the seventh. In today's culture, we are not a Monday through Friday culture necessarily. You know, cops work on the weekends, doctors work on the weekends. There's a lot of people who have to work on the weekends to keep our culture going the way it is currently set up. Whether you like it or not, that's just the way it is. But it's still important. And the Bible says it repeatedly. You need to rest in order to get refreshed, to get rejuvenated. If you work until you are completely burned out, you're not good to anybody. You need to have time to recharge, just like you recharge the battery on your phone, in order to be able to function within the community. Do not invoke the names of other gods. Okay, we've heard that one before. I'm not going to go deep into it. And then annual festivals are prescribed in this chapter. The festival of the unleavened bread commemorates the exodus from Egypt. The harvest festival is done at the beginning of the summer when people, when the people would harvest their first fruits. This was the time when they would say, look at this abundant harvest we have. Because typically, the first harvest is the biggest. And after that, you may have steady production. But it trails off as the, as the weather gets cooler. So this first harvest was the um, blessing that came after extensive hard work. And I will tell you, organic gardening is hard work. And they didn't have fertilizers and all that other stuff back then. So they were organic gardening. And the third is ingathering. And this is an annual festival of the final harvest. And it's kind of akin to our Thanksgiving. But it's when everybody gets together and uh, celebrates 
what a good harvest had been. And I think we can benefit from recognizing these things within our own community, within our own history, um, our exodus, our, the, when we were liberated may translate roughly to the 4th of July in the United States. The harvest, you know, that may translate roughly to the beginning of summer. Um, and then the ingathering may translate roughly to Thanksgiving. But these three times encourage us to really get together as a community instead of always being on our own little pods and our own little farms and our own little whatevers. We get together and we share and we recognize the interconnectedness of one another. And finally, the plan. God says, I'm sending an angel before you to prepare the way and bring you to the place I have prepared. Do not rebel against him because my name is in him. So God's saying, it's not me that's going before, but it is an angel I'm sending and he has my full authority. So you need to respect him. The angel will go ahead of you into the land of your enemies and wipe them out. But this will not be done in a single year because the land would become too desolate and you would be overrun by wild animals. So patience is required. Now, God is giving them this huge territory. And at this point, they're not numerous enough to manage that whole territory. So it's going to be a gradual encroachment upon the lands that they are to take. They're just, they're not going to just walk into it. And all of a sudden the entire land of milk and honey is going to be theirs. God is encouraging patience and saying, okay, you're going to get a little bit at a time. That way you can establish yourself and you can grow, become stronger and get ready to take on a little bit more. Do not worship other gods and eliminate all of their idols. Thinking back to maybe when you were a child, how tempting it might have been to think about witchcraft or sorcery, or as my son used to call them, poof up powers. Um, we see that in a, a lot in the media, and it can be distracting. So God says, you know, get rid of that stuff. So you're not even tempted to go there. You're not tempted to look for an easy way out. And you are focused on what you need to do in order to maintain good orderly direction. And do not let them live in your land or they will cause you to sin against me. Because the worship of their gods will certainly be a snare to you. The people had been oppressed and controlled for so long and they had not learned to self-govern. If you had gone to college, or even if, if you hadn't, when you moved out of your parents' house, for a lot of people, that was a huge transition. You don't, didn't have anybody telling you what to do and when to do it and how to do it and checking up on you. And the, the Israelites are going through a very similar transition here, and they're having to figure out how do we self-govern? How do we self-monitor? Until now, God's guidance had been somewhat has ha haphazard through Moses. You know, it's, trust me, we're going to this great place. Trust me, we can cross the Red Sea. See, I made it happen. Trust me, there's going to be plenty of food, and this is what you need to do when the manna from heaven come. Now, God is laying the foundation for what's needed to form a functioning society based on good orderly direction. It's moving from being completely parent-directed, just like the king used to be, be completely controlling. It's moving from being completely Moses-directed or directed by God through Moses um, to encouraging people to take personal responsibility for their actions and to learn how to behave in a godly manner. This is really foreshadowing to New Testament body of Christ, the fruits of the Spirit, what love is.